Get the home field advantage every time with Fairfield by Marriott, official hotel partner of the NCAA. Whether you're a student athlete working toward your championship dreams or your team's biggest fan, Fairfield by Marriott has everything you need to get ready for game day. From comfortable guest rooms to complimentary hot breakfast, Fairfield is part of the Marriott Bonvoy portfolio of hotels and official hotel partner of the NCAA. Visit fairfield.marriott.com to book your next game day stay. Whatever kind of night you're having, start it off right with Drizzly, the go-to app for drink delivery. Whether you're mixing up a bullet bourbon old-fashioned for a cozy night in, or a kettle one Bloody Mary bar for a birthday brunch, you can get the perfect beer, wine, and spirits for any occasion delivered with Drizzly. So, what's it gonna be? Download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com to choose your drinks today. Must be 21 plus, not available in all locations. The United States Border Patrol has exciting and rewarding career opportunities with the nation's largest law enforcement organization. Earn great pay, outstanding federal benefits, and up to $20,000 in recruitment incentives. Learn more online at cbp.gov slash career slash USBP. Welcome into The Verge, a show which covers the Baltimore Orioles minor leagues. The Verge is part of BSL Radio. Baltimore Sports and Life is dedicated to analysis and discussion on the Orioles, Baltimore Ravens, and the University of Maryland. The site has a team of writers providing coverage of those teams and houses live streaming content weekly. Join the conversations at the message board, like BSL on Facebook, and follow BSL on Twitter. On Twitter. On Twitter. On Twitter. On Twitter. Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and even earn money, all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer, so no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since we discovered Spotify for Podcasters, we feel like having options like video podcasts and Q&A lets us be more creative on another level. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. Welcome to On the Verge. This is Zach Spedden, joined as always by Bob Feld and Nick Stevens. And on tonight's episode, we welcome Jonathan Mayo, who covers the draft and minor league baseball for MLB.com and MLBpipeline.com. Jonathan, how are you? I'm doing all right. Thanks for having me. We're glad to have you here. So, MLB Pipeline recently ranked the Orioles as the number one farm system in the game. What, in your evaluation, makes this farm system the best in baseball? I think that uh, you know when we when we when we do the farm system rankings, and obviously it's you think ranking prospects is inexact. I mean, this isn't an exact science, but it's a combination of high level, you know, elite level prospects and depth in the system. It's not just going to be one or the other. And the Orioles have, you know, right now a, a really good combination of both those things. You know, they maybe, you know, lean a little bit more towards, like, if you're going to have those are two columns, uh, maybe a little bit more on the sort of high level. And, you know, maybe there's some other teams that might be a tiny bit deeper, but don't have, you know, the, the guys at the very, very top of, of the list that kind of puts the Orioles over the top. I think the top few organizations – you know, are, are you're splitting hairs, um, and you could you know, probably shuffle the deck and put the Mariners one and the Orioles two, or things like that, and and you wouldn't be wrong necessarily. But for now, we think the Orioles belong on top. You touched on the depth there. We know the Orioles are extremely top heavy with Rutschman and Rodriguez at the top of the list, but um, you, know, you guys noted the depth of the system as well. And this is something that we've constantly highlighted, especially over the last year with the return of minor league baseball. Um, how would you compare that depth to other organizations around the league though? I mean, it's, it's up there. I mean, there, there might be a couple of teams that are, you know, slightly more interesting. You know, I, I've been doing the Orioles list for, for a while. Uh, the last couple of years, Joe Trezza has done all the heavy lifting, but I still sort of work with him to put together the order. It, you know, a few years ago, coming up with 30 names that were worth talking about was a stretch. And for me, it's like, it's, it's more anecdotal, but when you're writing up 
or reading over 26 to 30. And you're like, wow, this guy's, this guy's interesting, or this guy's going to be a big leaguer. And then you know that behind those 30, there are more guys that are kind of interesting. That's when you know a team has really built out its depth. And it's also, you know, if you look at where these guys are going to be starting, um, it's top to bottom. Obviously, the the recommitment to Latin America has added a whole nother uh, layer of talent acquisition at the at kind of at the bottom levels. And we'll see how that shakes out. But uh, that ad, certainly adds to the sort of the excitement with the organization now, I think, um, in, in terms of bringing in guys who have the, the chance to be, you know, big league contributors, if not more. So you didn't have a lot of fun putting together a list with Irvin Ortega's and Randolph Gasaways in the back. I'm not, I'm not naming names. You're not going to get me to do that. <laughs> Adley Rushman ended up number two behind Bobby Wade on the overall top 100 list. Uh, both have strong arguments. Number one, as well as Julio Rodriguez. Great group there. I'm glad they're going to be starting on opening day, at least the, uh, the non Orioles. Is this group an outlier in terms of the separation between the top three and the rest of the hundred and how special are these three compared to like a normal year's top? I'll take the second part of that question first. It's, it's as good as it's been. Uh, I think in quite some time, um, I think my colleague, Jim Callis has pointed out, you know, if you go back to like 2018, you had Shohei Otani showing up and Ronald Acuna and Vladimir Guerrero. Um, that's tough to beat. You know, Shohei Otani is a totally different animal. Uh, you know, the next year you had Vlad Jr. and then Fernando Tatis and Eloy Jimenez. So you've had some good, very, you know, obviously, you know, Vlad Jr. is is a special player and Tatis has, you know, turned into – to something really extraordinary. And by the way, I'm looking at end of year lists and not preseason lists. I'm realizing, um, but there's been a combination that have been close, but this is to me as good as we've had. I think you could make a strong argument for any of those three guys being the number one guy, um, you know, and I, you know, I'm sure Orioles fans were outraged that we had Adley Rushman number two, you, again, like like I said, with the farm system rankings, I think you could shuffle the deck and you could put Rushman one and Wit two. You could put Rodriguez one. It, 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 it does matter. I don't know that in terms of separation, I don't think there's that much of a drop off. I like I think the very top of our top 100 is really really strong. Um, you know, you've got the Tigers combination of Torkelson and Green, and then you know your guy Grayson Rodriguez uh, at six. Maybe there's a bit of a drop off after that, but you know, all these the tons of guys up the middle. You know, we've got two catchers in the top, three catchers in the top ten. I don't know that we've ever had that. Um, you know, Anthony Volpe and C.J. Abrams have tons of upside as up the middle players. So I don't know that there's that much drop off from the top three to the to the next guys on the list. So one player that is, seems really tough to evaluate right now is Heston Kerstad. He missed last year with myocarditis. He's going to be hurt at the start of the year with a hamstring issue. So, But we know how much talent that he has and how much talent he's shown in the past. So when you're looking at him right now, how do you evaluate him? And then what what would you, I guess, call a success for him in 2022? Um, you know, let's have him play a game. <laughs> you know, and have and have an at bat, and then and then we'll see. I mean, he hasn't played any baseball in two years. You know, you consider twenty twenty was shortened anyway, so he hasn't played like anything close to a a full season since his sophomore year at Arkansas in twenty nineteen. So it's almost impossible to evaluate him. You know, we're kind of still giving him a little bit of the benefit of the doubt based on what his tools seem to be. But it, there's so much unknown. Listen, there's so much unknown with anybody coming off of that 2020 shutdown. You, you know, every player is going to be different in terms of how they come off of it. He has yet to come off of it. So we don't know. Um, just like, you know, in 2020, he came out of the shoot at Arkansas as the best college hitter in baseball. If it things had continued that, that route, the fact that the Orioles took him – that high would not have seen as a, oh, they're saving money, they're reaching for a guy. Right? He may have been the best college hitter in in baseball period without the, the asterisk of, of it being a shortened season. But 
who knows? Like, I, I honestly don't know. You know, I think you could have made an argument to put him almost anywhere on the Orioles top 30, um, you know, outside of the, you know, the, 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 the top few spots, you know, the top 100 guys, um, you know, could he have been as high as six or seven? Sure. Could he be 24? Yep. Like, I, I, I don't, I don't know. You know, I think we tried to sort of hedge our bets a little, uh, snuck him into that back end of the top 10 based on what it looked like he might be. And then we're going to sort of see once he once he gets out there and hopefully can stay healthy and, and see what he can do. But, you know, we haven't seen this guy face competitive pitching in such a long time that it's, it's almost impossible. He may have been one of the largest wild cards of any player on any list. Nice. Yeah, fair enough. Um, we're definitely it's, – it's frustrating, especially after that second injury uh, with the hamstring this year. Um, hopefully we get to see him at some point this year. But um, another guy is coming off an injury, but I know you've written about him a couple of times. Uh, MLB Pipeline is seems to be the, the high outlet on Joey Ortiz. Uh, kind of gets overlooked, I think, because, uh, you know, with Gunnar Henderson, Jordan Westberg, some good up the field, up the middle depth in the system. But what kind of feedback are you getting on, on Joey Ortiz when putting this list together and, and when you visit spring camp recently? Yeah, uh, well, I'll tell you, when I visited spring camp, there wasn't a whole lot of anything going on. Um, so it's not like I, I saw him doing anything. I think it may have, he took one live live BP at bat that I happened to see. But um, he, you know, I think the thing that has stood out in terms of the feedback we've gotten is he came in as a guy who could really, really defend. And he still can do all that. He is... Uh, arguably the the best defensive infielder in the system, um, and that's not taking you know taking anything away from Gunnar Henderson or Jordan Westberg, who are kind of a little bit freaks of nature just because of how big they are. But Joey Ortiz can flat out play defense, and the bat is starting to to catch up. He's going to be a glove first guy, but I think you know there's a little bit more there in terms of what he's going to be able to do offensively that makes him a more well rounded player, at least in terms of what. Uh, folks within the Orioles system uh, and, you know, some feedback that we get externally. Um, but I know that he showed up to, to camp this spring. He's a little stronger so he can impact the ball. Um, there's some pop there. Um, so he went from being a guy who looked like a, a, a defensive utility guy, which almost can't exist in today's game to a guy who looks like maybe he has a chance to be an everyday shortstop because he's going to hit enough and play really, really good defense up the middle. Yeah, that's very good stuff. Um, obviously, the Orioles are loaded with positional talent, uh, but there is a little bit of debate on the merits of the pitching depth in the system. Do you think that compared to other teams that it's it's okay in that regard, or do you think they're going to have to trade from their uh, positional depth to acquire a more top-line pitching down the line? I, I think it's going to depend on what happens with a few of these guys in this year. I mean, we'll, we'll put a pin in Grayson Rodriguez cause he's what everyone wants. And, uh, and you know, he's frontline starter potential all the way, you know, can DL hall stay healthy enough, throw enough strikes to, to be the guy that we think he can be. Um, I don't know. You know, we'll have to, we'll have to, we'll have to see on that. And that, you know, if he can, then suddenly you've got a righty lefty combination. That's as just about as good as there is. And that's a pretty good foundation. But then, you know, you, you look at a guy like Kyle Bradish and, and 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 Mike Bauman, you know, who's now they're both getting a little bit older. This is a big year for them to sort of show what they they can do. The, you know, they're. I feel like this is where you insert that you can never have enough pitching uh, axiom, which is so well worn. But like with most cliche things, there's some truth to it, and um, there are. Uh, you know, it's definitely the hitters that make the system stand out more, but there are some interesting pitchers. Um, I don't know that you necessarily trade for more pitching at this point. I think wait and see once things start turning the corner a little bit. You know, the Chicago Cubs still haven't been able to develop pitching, and, uh, you know, they managed to win by acquiring pitching at the big league level, but I think the Orioles are a step or two away from having to worry about that. You alluded to this um, earlier, but how important has it been for the Orioles to rebuild or build 
that scouting department in Latin America under Kobe Perez and Michael Elias and become more active in the international free agent market? I mean, it's, it's essential. Like, you know, it's why would you, whatever industry or business you're in, keep yourself from acquiring talent from a, a huge market that everyone else in your industry is, is got their you know, their their toes and their feet in but up to their necks in you know it it boggles my mind that here we are in 2022 and this is like a new new shiny toy for the Orioles like um I, I don't understand it I will never understand it uh so the fact that they did that it just it just opens up more you know more doors you know they they went in they went in hard uh, and then it's just you know, question of, are they good at evaluating, uh, at evaluating the talent, you know, uh, and which is the same for all 30 organizations. Uh, if you're good at it and you find good players, I marvel at Latin American scouts because you're looking at 14, 15 year olds and trying to think about what they're going to be when they're 24. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a really hard and they're going to miss, you're going to miss a lot. You know, uh, I, I look at uh, we have a huge kind of database of international signings over the last several years. And you look at guys who got seven figures and like, what happened to that guy? Is he even in baseball? You know, and there are guys who got thirty thousand dollars who are like knocking on the door in the big leagues. Hey, Ronald Acuna, I think only got one hundred thousand dollars. So it, it's it, it's a hard market. Right. But. I don't think you can be successful long term as an organization without w- w- without being involved in it. So uh, that was a as a as big of a move, as big of a sign that the Orioles were serious in terms of trying to actually build uh, an organization that could succeed. Uh, nothing was bigger than than reestablishing uh, ties to Latin America. Yes. Love it. We're excited. Del- Delmarva, the, the low A team, is loaded with some of these international signings and guys they've traded for. So that's that's the team I know we're going to be focusing heavily on this year. Uh, but since you're here, we have to ask you about uh, a fellow Mayo in Kobe Mayo, um, of course. So what what is this kid's ceiling? Because he's a favorite of ours. Um, how high can this guy climb up you know, prospect lists? And, and what kind of a future ball player do you see in Kobe Mayo? Well, it's family, you know, so... Uh... <laughs> Um, I, I, you know, I have to be careful. Otherwise I won't be welcome at Thanksgiving. Uh, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, or am I, um, no, he's got, I, it, listen, he's one of these guys, he's going to play in the big leagues and it's going to be a question of, is he Joey Gallo, right? Does he hit 200 with a bunch of homers or is there a little bit more of a hit tool there, which turns him into an all-star kind of player? And I think, uh, you know, we're going to have to wait and see. He showed a little bit more um, hitability than I think some were expecting. Um, We'll have to see where he ends up playing. He's so big. Um, I almost, you know, I wouldn't want to move him to first base because the arm is is ridiculous. I I almost would put him in left field. Um, You know, in terms of Joey Gallo, that's where, like, I think there are a lot of similarities because, like, oh, I don't think he can play third. We don't know first. And Joey Gallo has t- turned himself into, a, like, a really good defensive outfielder, which is something nobody predicted. Um, and I think that that Kobe Mayo, you know, he's athletic enough where he can handle it. It wouldn't be like, a, oh, to stand out there and if it's hit your way, catch the ball. I think he actually could be pretty good out there. Now, I wouldn't move him off a third yet. You know, let him let him – keep getting his reps there and see what happens. Um, there are plenty of guys who, you know, have played that position and like, Oh, I don't you know. Chris Bryant played, you know, probably still could play there if there was the need. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think he, he has the chance to be an impact bat. It's just going to be a question of what it looks like in terms of what those numbers are. But, you know, if you told me that regardless of he hits for average, he hits 30 homers a year in the big leagues, I could believe it. Yeah, for sure. Um, Prospect rankings are just that and obviously don't guarantee future success. But how much does it typically correlate for a team to reach the top of your list and then, you know, make a playoff appearance not too long after? 
uh, without making it sound like I'm sort of tooting our own horn, because I think this is true of all sort of prospect rankings, there is a definitive correlation between having a highly rated farm system and top level prospects and big league success. You know, does it mean you you win a World Series? No, that there are too many variables that come into play. But you know, you look over the years, um, you know, the Houston Astros, um, Kansas City Royals, going back to 2011, when everyone was like, "Oh, this is the best farm system anyone's ever seen," and they cashed in all those chips. Some got to the big leagues. They used a bunch of trades and they won it all. Uh, you know, you look at what the Atlanta Braves did last year using their farm system, um, which was, you know, really highly rated. The list goes on on the Chicago Cubs, you know, when they won. So uh, there is a direct correlation. And then it's going to come down to how how you use the, that strength of your system. And, you know, none of it matters until these guys get to the big leagues. You know, we could – pound the table and say Adley Rushman should be the best prospect in baseball. He still has to go and, and play well, at the big league level. Now, no one doubts that he is going to, right? He, like he's as close to a can't miss as there can be assuming health and everything else, but you still need to go and and do that part. So this is all kind of on paper, but by and large, when you, when you have a top, top farm system, because those guys get to the big leagues and produce. And because you have depth, then you can start making trades from from the depth of your system to help the to help the big league club find those final pieces that maybe you weren't able to get through homegrown talent. Well, Jonathan, we really appreciate you coming on tonight. We have two quick listener questions, and we'll let you go. Right. The first one here is from Justin, who first of all wants to make sure that uh, we tell you that you rule, and he loves your MLB Network work on the draft. Cool. Uh, <laughs> And he wants to know who's your top draft prospect as of right now. As of right now, it probably would be Drew Jones. That's Andrew Jones's son. Um, and boy, I'm old. Um, when we, with the sons of guys that I remember as prospects is like I've been doing this too long, guys. But uh, um, but you know, he, there, there are three high school guys have been at the top. We're, we're we're actually digging into a new uh, d- new draft list. The top 150 will be out in a few weeks, and it'll probably still be uh, some combination of Drew Jones, uh, Tamar Johnson, who's uh, a high school infielder from from Georgia, also can really really hit. One of the best high school hitters we've seen in a very long time, and then Elijah Green, who has stupid power. He's is just a tool chest with some questions about the the swing and miss in his game. But those are the top three guys, all high school guys. A lot of bats uh, in this uh, in this class overall. Uh, one more, one last question from Chris. Uh, he wants to know the Orioles, you know, with this recent Tanner Scott Cole Sulcer trade, acquired the uh, comp B round pick from the Miami Marlins. So five picks in the top seventy five, I believe now. Uh, but his question is, how does this uh, affect? Do you think this affects the team's flexibility with? with the draft does this affect their flexibility significantly or is this just another chance to to get a good prospect at the top of the draft both i mean you know it's i think teams have shown the ability to when you have extra picks that means your your draft pool is larger and then you can be as creative as you want to be you could go straight up and take the best player each time uh, and afford to do that um, and that's the thing I think people don't realize that even if you're picking at the very top of the draft, like no, no one ever really signs for like full, full slot, like at the very, very top. So you could take the best player and then be aggressive. Now, I think we've seen what Michael Elias likes to do with the draft and he tends to be more on the creative side and flexible side. Um, you know, so having the extra picks just gives you more to work with so that if you decide to save some money up top, then you can see who that guy you didn't think was going to be there when at, with that comp pick. <clears throat> you know, you, I look. You know, I live in Pittsburgh. You look at what the Pirates did um, in last year's draft, and they, you know, took the guy they liked the best at the top and saved money because there wasn't a slam dunk number one guy. And then also went after three high end high school guys. Now you're rolling the dice there, but it can be done. And I think that's probably what you'll see, you know, the Orioles do 
um, you know, when, when it comes down to, to the draft is that you can kind of have your cake and eat it too when you have that large of a bonus pool. I love doing that. Well, Jonathan, we really appreciate you coming on. And before you go, um, tell our listeners where they can follow you on Twitter and what's coming up at MLB Pipeline. Uh, yeah, I'm at Jonathan Mayo. It's uh, quick and simple. Um, and what's not coming up on MLB Pipeline? I mean, this is just an insane week. Uh, it's an unprecedented time for top prospects making opening day rosters. If it weren't for injuries, we you know we we might have had our top five prospects on opening day rosters with with Adley Rushman at the top and Riley Green in the back end. As it is, we have three of them. We've got Hunter Green making his big league debut, Nick Lodolo with the Reds. It, so there's all that. We've got minor league opening day. And like I said, in a few weeks, we'll have a new draft uh, top 150 uh, rolling out as, as well. So there will not be a lot of sleep in the uh, in the Jonathan Mayo household, not the Kobe Mayo <laughs> household, but the Jonathan Mayo household. Well, best of luck. And we really enjoy the work that you and the team do over there. So thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you. It's Jonathan Mayo of MLB Pipeline. Um, we'll just start off here, Bob. What is your uh, just kind of takeaway from the interview? I guess we're guaranteed to make the playoffs in two years. You heard it here first. Uh, Jonathan Mayo <laughs> called it. No. Uh, great stuff. Um, we, we knew Jonathan Mayo would bring the heat, and he did. He was, you know, in the time he gave us, very busy. He, he provided a lot of good insight, so appreciate him coming on. Yeah, that was my big takeaway. I mean, we're we're getting to playoffs like uh, next year, so uh, all this this infighting and craziness over the last twenty four hours among Orioles fans. Um, Jonathan Mayo put it to bed, put, <laughs> brought the hammer down. Uh, no, uh, yeah, it's all it's it's cool to get. You know, we've had Kyle Glazer, we Mayo. You know, we had Eric Logan hanging last year. I wish we could have got him on this year to talk about his list as well. But the list are over. Minor league baseball starts in less than twenty four hours now. Is the time of this recording. But it's always fun to get different perspectives on guys. And you know, to hear someone like Jonathan Mayo be so high on Kobe Mayo and so high on the system as a whole, it's it's reassuring. So it's it's fun. Appreciate having him on for sure. Yeah, couldn't agree more. We really enjoyed our discussion with him and. Now we'll just go right into that topic that has caused the infighting in Birdland since the news broke on Sunday night that the Orioles had dealt Tanner Scott and Cole Saucer to the Miami Marlins in exchange for prospects Antonio Velez and Kevin Guerrero, as well as a player to be named later, and the Marlins pick in the competitive round balance round B of the 2022 draft, which we just talked about a little bit with Jonathan. But to get into the prospects that the Orioles are getting back in this deal, Velez is a left-handed pitcher that Baseball America cited as having the best change-up in the Marlins farm system, and his excellent control was marked by a one walk per nine rate in 99 innings last year between high A Beloit and double A Pensacola. He's expected the pitch of Bowie to start the year. And then Kevin Guerrero is an outfielder that will add to the Orioles' young depth at the low levels of the system. 17-year-old outfielder about to turn 18 here in a couple of weeks coming off a solid season in the Dominican Summer League and looks likely to be at the Florida Complex League. And the Orioles will, of course, pick up a player to be named later, as well as that extra pick in this summer's draft. It's been interesting to see the reaction to this trade. And I want to get your thoughts on this because it feels like there's really two types of reactions that we see to trades the Orioles make. It's the trade on its merits, on its own. You know, what does this do? Now, what is it going to do down the road? That was the Michael Gibbons trade. That's how that was assessed. But then you have these trades that I feel like some fans and some you know, baseball writers even analyze in the context of what this says about what the Orioles are doing. The Jose Iglesias trade fit that mold, and this trade does too, because the reaction that you're hearing that is negative really doesn't have to do with the return. It has to do with the fact that the Orioles gave up two relievers that were not going to cost them a lot of money this year, that had a few years of team control left, and that they haven't added to the bullpen or to the rotation beyond the Jordan Wiles signing. And here we go. Here's another 110 lost season because the bullpen just got a lot worse. So, Nick, you expressed recently that you thought the Orioles might have made a mistake holding on to Tanner Scott at the deadline last year. So I want to start with you on this because, you know, you've talked about this before. What are your thoughts on this deal? 
I'm glad it happened 24 hours ago and not like right before we came on the air because I was I was ready to spit some hot takes on here uh, about this trade, but uh, not going to go there. Uh, yeah, it's look, if you're upset about it, I get it. I fully get the arguments as to why you don't want to see these guys traded right now. I get it. But at the same time, like I just how many years in a row are we going to sit here and say Tanner Scott, if he could just throw strikes, he'd be a good reliever. Like the guy's getting old. He's 27, 28 years now. He, he's not throwing strikes. And so I, I think trading him, you're not losing a lot of production. I think you can replace that production with someone like Brian Baker and or Felix Batista, uh, some other guys, the piggybacking. If the Orioles truly stick to this piggybacking situation that they want to do, like that's going to require, hopefully, I know this is ideally, and we're talking about Orioles starting pitching here, but you, you limit uh, the, the bullpen innings that you need. Um, and Cole Solcer is like a 32-year-old guy they got off waivers. Like the Orioles are going to be able to get more of those guys. So um, I don't really think you're losing a whole lot as far as like the big trade goes. And, you know, we can talk about the, the return specifically, I, I guess, as well. And my thoughts there were, you mentioned about Velez, like Velez, like four pitch lefty, we'll see, um, you know, uh, what he can become. Um, but, you know, he's the 34th ranked prospect in the Marlins system. And I know a lot of people are like, you didn't even get a top 30 prospect for him. Well, you, you technically, Baseball America, you got one. And then Velez is ranked 34th here. You mentioned the Walker eight. He doesn't walk guys. That's all Tanner Scott does is walk guys. So Velez doesn't walk guys. Um, you know, there's apparently the velo bump. Marlins writers love this guy. We had a Marlins beat writer actually reach out last night. I was like, you guys got a gem. And, and we'll see just how much of a gem he is. But Marlins fans love this guy. Uh, so we'll see what Velez becomes. Um, but the kicker for me, and Guerrero, we'll, we'll talk about him in like five years. I get that, that seems like a really long-term project there. But the kicker for me was the draft pick. I mean, five picks in the top 75 now, like we just mentioned, almost another million dollars or so added to their draft pool, which is already the largest among all 30 teams. I think now the Orioles can be extremely aggressive with this draft, take pretty much whoever they want, and they have an opportunity to just clean up in what is hopefully – uh, the last time we're picking one, one for a, a very long time. So, um, you know, without the pick, I think it's meh. I wouldn't be like overly excited about this trade. I would just say, let's see what these guys can do. Um, happy trails, Tanner Scott and Cole Solcer. But with that draft pick, like that tilts it for me that I, I like this deal and I have no issues whatsoever with it. There's so much to get to <laughs> with this trade. It's so much to it. Uh, first, as far as like people getting upset, I do understand. And even uh, some one of our patrons, Dave, came out today and said it's not so much the trade itself. It's just that, you know, they didn't spend money on improving the roster for this year, even if it's just one year deals on veterans that are only going to get not even double digits, millions of dollars. I get that. I totally do. I think you can make the same improvements that they have been and spend a little bit of money to try to improve the roster. That's not what they've decided to do. So just looking at the trade as a whole, I mean, <laughs> If we would have traded Tanner Scott and Cole Saucer for the same exact return July 31st or whatever the deadline was last year, because I know it's been slightly moving around a little bit, uh, I feel like this reaction would not have happened. I feel like it would have been like, yay, they did something, they got something, you know, this is the end of a, another losing season, at least we got something out of these guys. So the fact that they're traded now, I don't really see the difference. And like Nick said, I think it's a good trade. If I trade, I mean, I compare Velez to an Alexander Wells or a Garrett Stallings where he's basically Alexander Wells with better raw stuff. We'll see if that translates more at the higher levels. And Garrett Stallings, he's basically like a left-handed Garrett Stallings with maybe a better changeup. Obviously, he had the best changeup in the Marlins system. Great control guy. Kevin Guerrero, I was comparing to Steven Acevedo, another tall guy uh, international player who the Orioles have in their system that could use a lot of time to fill out and improve his skills but the raw town is there he signed for six hundred thousand dollars so basically around the same as Anderson De Los Santos who is an exciting player on to come up now for the Orioles so they have someone to work with there be very interesting to see who the player to be named later is I mean it could be a recent draftee recent international signing maybe it's Nick Neidert who <laughs> the Marlins just DFA'd and Actually, wouldn't be too mad about that. And then, of course, the comp pick, which just gives us, you know, Elias is really taking advantage of this, hopefully, last year of being at the very, very top of the draft and going to do everything he can to make the most of this this year's draft. Yeah, I, the, the draft pick for me is what kind of tilts the scales uh, of this deal, and I agree with Nick there. 
because it does give you that flexibility and it does give you the opportunity to add another good player at the top of the draft. And, you know, we're not looking just at the last year of the Orioles, hopefully picking this high in the draft, but we're also looking at the last draft without a draft lottery. We don't really know what's going to, you know, determine where the Orioles pick next year because they could have the worst record in the league again and draft fifth, or they could have, you know, the, fourth worst record in the league or the sixth worst record in the league and pick first. Um, so there's a lot of variables you can't take into account. Whereas this draft, you know what the system is. You can dive right in and start to make some move. Um, with Velez, I feel like anytime you have a lefty who doesn't walk anybody and has a good change up, I'll work with that. Yeah. Even if that's a reliever down the road, that's something I think you can work with. And, you know, Bob, I think that's, kind of an apt comparison with maybe Alexander Wells, but better of all stuff, because the one thing that we've talked about for years with Alexander Wells is his pitches are all fine, but there's nothing there that really stands out. Whereas Velez at least has to change up Guerrero, you know, six years from now, ask me what happens. Uh, this is either going to be a stroke of genius or we're not going to remember that he was included in the trade, but this kind of, feels like one of those moves where we talk about you raise the floor of the system. Now you've had an 18 year old outfielder who's going to be in the FCL this year has an interesting mix of tools. Maybe he puts them together. Um, and a year or two down the line, you've got a really nice outfield prospect in your hand at the lower levels of the system. Who's in his early twenties and could, you know, help you within a couple of years or be a trade chip when the time does come to go out and get talent. I do want to get to the frustrations of this deal, though, because I understand it. I understand where the Orioles are, you know, setting, you know, looking like they're coming up with another bad season. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the reaction to this deal was so bad right after Dean Kramer got hit around in a spring training outing against the Twins. I don't think those two things are entirely unrelated to each other because I have to admit, I was watching that game, and I felt kind of down watching it. Um, it was not fun. And I do have fears about the starting rotation this year. And that's something we'll talk about in our opening day prediction so later this week. But I'll say this about Solster and Scott. Their not being here really doesn't change the way that I look at the 22, 22 Orioles very much. Because at the end of the day, if your starting rotation is not better than it was last year and you don't do a better job shoring up some parts of the roster that were terrible last year, like most of the infield spots other than where Ryan Malcastle and Ramona Rios were playing on a given night, it's not going to matter. It's not going to matter who's going to be in the bullpen because the rest of the team is so bad that Cole Salter could go out and have another two and a half win season and it's not going to make a difference. You know, and I think that that production, you have a mixture of guys like Felix Batista, Nick Vespi, CNL Perez, Brian Baker, uh, that you can try to make up for that, I think, and possibly succeed. Um, but it's not going to matter if your starting rotation is bad. So losing two bullpen arms, even if you have high hopes for them going to Miami, doesn't significantly change anything about the 2022 Orioles. It, it just doesn't. Yeah, it's all in what the rotation is going to do and what those weak spots from last year, if they're going to come back or not. Yeah. And it's, it's like you said, we've talked about this before. There are some guys that are going to be better relief prospects this year than than the last couple. So like the guys you mentioned and Logan Gillespie, Nolan Hoffman, Cole Uvula, there's plenty of guys that actually have more potential than, you know, the Dustin Knights of the world, the Manny Barretas who, you know, they weren't terrible pitchers, at least at the minor league level. But I feel like there's more upside there. There's more raw stuff when it comes to that. So you're opening up spots for them. You're opening up spots for guys who aren't going to make the rotation. Maybe Keegan Aiken can, can try – to be Tanner Scott with a much less good pitches, but uh, <laughs> you know, these guys that are flaming out a little bit. And maybe we should get to that comment that uh, Mike Elias made about the guys that we saw make their major league debuts, or at least get their real first shot at the majors last year. 
uh, you know, Dean Kramers of the world, maybe they can try out in the, in the bullpen instead. And with the 26 man roster in a month or so, you know, guys like Salser and Scott, who you pretty much know who they are, they're, they're taking up their spots. So you, you need them to find out what you got moving forward. Yeah. You still have, I think, what could be a decent bullpen here. Like if Jorge Lopez is your late inning guy, I mean, we saw what he can do out of the bullpen. Uh, he was pretty good in a small sample. And so, I, and everyone, I feel like all Orioles fans have been clamoring for him to get to the bullpen. Well, here he is. He's in the bullpen now. So let's see that. Uh, I know a lot of people have been high on moving Kramer and Aiken uh, to the bullpen. Well, here's that opportunity to do that. Um you know, I think Paul Frey can turn it around. And I think the Orioles liked what they saw. We, it's clear that if the Orioles don't think you are going to be able to contribute even to a 100 loss team, like they're going to get rid of you pretty quickly. They brought Paul Fry back. They didn't have to. Um, so I know there's all the jokes about, you know, him facing the Rays, but he's looked decent this spring. Um, Dylan Tate, we still don't know what he can become, but I, I think the, we li- all like what we've seen out of him this spring. Um, so, you know, Perez has been interesting. Siono Perez, the waiver claim there. I think Joey Crable had a – I think his last outing was was really – he looked really good last time. That could be a guy that, that fills a couple of innings for you there. Brian Baker's looked good minus that last inning. Uh, Travis Lakins is, is still around. Um, that You could use him, like, uh, you know, whatever. You can fill you a couple of innings there. But, like, you've got guys to fill the innings, and I think you've got intriguing arms that uh, can get an opportunity. And I, I honestly, you know, I've kind of come around the idea. I think I'm fully bought in to the idea of just keep Michael Bauman in the bullpen. I think Nathan Ruiz made that comment in uh, that game against the Twins when Bauman came in in the middle of the inning. They didn't give him the clean inning. He was like, could this be a sign of, of maybe what's to come? Uh, not giving him the clean inning, bringing him with guys on base in the middle of the inning, try to get one more out. Uh, maybe there's something to that. And I'm fine with you know sticking Michael Bauman in the bullpen and, and let's rock with him there because I think that stuff could work very well in, in short innings. And there, you've got Grayson Rodriguez coming up soon. You've got Kyle Bradish is right there. It seems like the organization is not going to be hesitant to bring DL Hall up. Um, I think the starters are going to come down the road. So why not use these these you know struggling sophomores that Michael Elias has been referring to? Try them in the pen. Here's your opportunity. And as we've seen with Tyler Wells this year, you know if you think there's a possibility there to put them in the rotation down the line, you can do that. Uh, we did have a good question here from Vivek that I want to bring up before we go over to our discussion about the Orioles starting rotation and some comments Michael Elias made, which is, do you guys feel that Perez made Scott expendable in a way? Which is the interesting thought because Cnel Perez, a waiver claim over the offseason um, from Cincinnati, has come in and had a pretty good spring training. He's also out of options. So he seemed like a guy that, if it was a close call, was going to make the opening day roster for that reason. But, you know, on his performance, he has earned an opening day roster spot. So curious to get your guys' thoughts there. I would say maybe not exactly, but I don't think it hurts. I mean, he he's looked good this spring. He's a guy, a lefty that throws hard and has a lot of the same issues Scott has had as far as why he hasn't been able to make it so far in his career at the major league level. He's got a little bit of control issues. Haven't seen it in the spring. So maybe he's ironed, ironed that out a little bit. I'm excited to see what he can do for the Orioles. That's, you know, maybe we've been saying Tanner Scott, if he could just get his control a little bit better for like four or five years now. So let's, let's say the same thing about Ciano Perez and maybe it'll work out this time. Yeah. I, I like that. Maybe not, maybe indirectly, but yeah, Perez like is, seems like an exact clone of Tanner Scott. Um, how old is Perez? Let me see. Uh, see 25, 26. Yeah. So he's like two, three years younger version of uh, Tanner Scott there. High strikeouts, huge velo, walks a lot of guys, good ground ball numbers. Uh, you don't know exactly what you're going to get, but he has look good in spring. So um yeah, like that's that's one of the guys that can replace that production that Tanner Scott's going to give you. Like, I don't know what Scott has, has done. I'm trying to pull up like his, you know, F4 and stuff. I mean, great podcasting material. Yeah, right. yeah. like 0. 0.1, 0. 0.4, 0. 0.4. I mean, he, he's been fine. Like, you can replace that, I feel like, pretty easily. And Cole Solcer, too. Cole Solcer may not be in baseball in three years, right? He'd probably be retired. So, we need games. Let's talk about baseball games. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Seattle Perez, what do you know? A, a waiver claim. So you can replace the Cole Saucer production with another waiver claim, a younger one. 
So here's the comments that Michael Elias made, and it felt unusually contrite for him, which is why I think it made the rounds earlier on Monday. And the full quote here from Nathan Ruiz at the Baltimore Sun, and this is from Michael Elias. Obviously, our pitching staff, it's going to be a struggle sometimes to cover innings, and it's something that we're certainly aware of and worrying about and talking about. But there's a lot of opportunity here for the players that are here and that are coming. I also think we have a really good chance of getting some big graduations in that department as well, and we're looking forward to that, but we're counting on means and wiles once they get built up to hopefully remain healthy and be strong, and we're really counting on this group, and this is what kind of caught everybody's attention. Zimmerman, Lothar, Kramer, Ballman, the guys that are on the 40-man, Keegan Aiken, that we've been pitching the last couple of years, some of those guys need to step up. That's why we're struggling right now is because we haven't gotten a real cemented breakout from one of those guys. And we still have high hopes for them and want some of those guys to click this year because it's going to be tough if they don't. And we're going to have to move on to other people. Yeah, I mean, it's he's right. I mean, he's 100 percent right. And we've said that before, I think, numerous times on this show. Like we need at least one of those guys to step up this year. And I feel like it also that's a major reason why a lot of fans look at so many of the, these pitching prospects, right? Your Drew Roms, your Kyle Bronoviches, your Zach Peaks. They look at these guys who are might be fringy starters. Like, are they back end starters or are they relievers at the next level? Uh, and I, a lot of Orioles fans are going to say, well, we haven't been able to develop any of these guys into the major league. So what makes me think that the organization can do it to these guys? All right. Um, so I, I, I do get that, and I do 100% agree with that. One of the, At least one of those guys does need to step up this year because it's it's been tough. Um, and so we'll we'll see what happens. Though. But like I said, you put Bauman in the bullpen. I like that. And then just uh, – I would consider that a success, though. I don't know if, if you guys would consider that a success or other Orioles fans would say if the other three of those or those other guys flame out but Bauman's a good reliever, is that a positive sign? I, I tend to say yes, but – yeah, I don't really understand why people are upset about this quote. I think it's kind of refreshingly honest, and it just shows the frustration that we all have. I mean, it's harsh, but it's fair. I mean, these guys, maybe it stems from the fact that, you know, they aren't his guys. These are the guys he, you know, he came into, and and he's like, man, it's working for the guys I've brought in and we've brought up from the way back. I mean, from the way all the way up, how come uh, – the development tricks that me and Chris Holt have implemented aren't exactly doing the trick for the guys that were already here. I, I don't know if that's the case, but I mean, yeah, could have signed some more major league caliber guys, but then you would be taking away the chances from these people, these players to, uh, to break out like they were hoping they would. So I, I don't know. I like when uh, the people in power are honest because it's very rare that they are. And the point that I would make is that I think every one of those players that Michael Elias mentioned really doesn't have anything left to prove in the minor leagues. I mean, we've been critical of the way that the Orioles handled Zach Lothar last year, not giving him a consistent routine, not leaving him in one place really long enough for him to get settled. And I stand by that. But I think even if you sent Lothar to Norfolk to start this year, you're not doing that indefinitely. You're doing that to let him get his feet wet, and then you're going to test him in the big leagues again. Yeah, I think that all of these players are at the point now where it's you're not going to go to AAA and prove anything that you haven't proven already. So the time has come to really step up and settle into a big league role. And the next question, yes, I would consider that a success. If Ballman becomes a good major league reliever, I would take that as a success. And honestly, I'd take that with any of these players. You know, Ballman's the more exciting one to think about in the bullpen just because of how his stuff could play there. But if any of these players become productive relievers and they're around for the next few years, I'll consider that a success. Yeah, for sure. And also, one last thing about that quote. If you were to show that quote to all the guys that he mentioned that need to step up, how many of them would disagree? I mean, they have to feel the same way. They, they've struggled. I think even Bruce Zimmerman uh, had a comment today as well. and was like, yeah, I, I agree with him. You know, we need to pitch better and it's up to us to, to do it. So that's the last thing I had to say about that. I think there's one guy on that list. That would probably disagree, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we won't, we won't go there, but yeah. um, 
Yeah, that's somebody's got to step up. I do agree. I think every Orioles fan would agree, and I think that would go a long way in calming uh, maybe some tensions and, and some some harsh feelings. If you got to see some development at the major league level, and as high as we are on so many guys and this minor league system as a whole, none of us would disagree that we got to start seeing it translate at the major league level. Bats too. Jemai Jones last year, like that was that was rough. Um, we got to see more of that up the next level. Ryan Mountcastle, I think, was a good start. That's a good success story, uh, but you need more of that. So. We'll see what 2022 brings. I couldn't agree more. And now we'll turn our attention to the farm system as all break camp rosters for the Orioles for full season affiliates are out. Bob and I covered Norfolk's roster last week, but we will give Nick a chance to weigh in on that since we have him on tonight. But we also have the rosters for the Bowie Bay Sox, the Aberdeen Ironbirds and the Delmarva Shorebirds. And, once again, looking at some rosters, all four rosters are exciting to start the year. But once again, Bowie might be in the best position to succeed of anybody. Uh, maybe the best roster top to bottom in the system. But that's something we can talk about a little bit more. So, Nick, since you didn't get a chance to weigh in on Norfolk last week, any thoughts on the Tides roster? Yeah, yeah. Um... And we were just a little bit too late getting Brad Selick on. I wonder what uh, could ask him about that extra draft pick, extra million dollars. What fun he's going to have with that. Um, but yeah, this Norfolk roster, I love seeing Kyle Brownovich in Norfolk. I know we talked about that uh, on a recent show. Um, yeah, I, I was curious, would he crack that Norfolk roster? Would it be pushed to Bowie? It's good to see that the Orioles went ahead and pushed him up to Norfolk. Um, could pro- I think there's a small change to see him at the major leagues at some point this year. Um you know, Bob touched on our, our Kevin Smith findings last week. He's getting the opening day nod for Norfolk this year. So I'm anxious to see how he handles uh, a clean slate in 2022. Uh, and I will be the first to apologize to Kevin Smith if uh, he takes advantage of that. Um, but I think the outfield really needs to produce, though. Like, can DS stay healthy? Obviously, I, I didn't even say that. Um, Robert Newstrom, I know he's become a fan favorite of Orioles fans. Like, can he be consistent all year? Same for Stowers. Can he avoid the long slumps? Can he keep that walk rate high? Continue to use the whole field like he was when he got Norfolk last year. Um, you know, those are kind of some of the things I'm looking for. And of course, there's this Grayson Rodriguez guy I've heard is pretty good. So that'll be a, a fun, fun guy to go watch down in Norfolk if you uh, make the trek down there. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So we'll start with Billy's roster. And really the highlight here is the infield. Because you're going to have Gunnar Henderson, Joey Ortiz, and Jordan Westbrook in that mix, along with Andrew Dasbach and J.D. Mundy. You also have Adam Hall there. So the infield is stacked, but you look around this roster, and this is why I think it's the deepest of the bunts. In the outfield, you're going to have Zach Watson and Hudson Haskin out there to go with Shane Fontana and Toby Welk, plus probably see Dasbach and Hall a little bit in the outfield. Maverick Hanley behind the plate with Cody Roberts, catching a pitching staff that is going to include the likes of Zach Peake, Drew Rahm, Garrett Stallings, Brandon Young, along with some guys like Logan Gillespie and Cameron Bishop, who got time at Bowie last year and are going to be back there. Connor Lopritz is there. Nolan Hoffman, a minor league Wolf 5 pick. Uh, Selton Perkins is making the move up. And you're going to have Morgan McSweeney, who Fangraphs has kind of picked out as a possible breakout candidate for this year that we should have our eyes on. So this is coming off a championship appearance in Bowie, pretty deep roster. How dare you? Did you mention Adam Stoffer? I did not. And I should have. (laughs) No, it's, I'd love this pitching staff. Yeah. Obviously the infield is like the eye catching portion of the roster list here because of all these great high end names, but I, I am a big fan of this pitching staff. You got, Drew Rom, Zach Peake, Garrett Stallings, Ryan Watson, Brandon Young, Cameron Bishop. I mean, that's loaded there. Six-man rotation, I'm assuming. And then a bunch of guys that could really end up being good relievers like Logan Gillespie and Nolan Hoffman and and Adam Stauffer. I guess we can mention him. Um, I, I'm excited for Billy. I might go to Sunday afternoon's game. I might drive down, make the long drive, and check him out just because why not? Baseball's here. Yeah, this is when I get super jealous because I'm like Monday morning, 6 a.m. I'm going to be welcoming my second child. Uh, so as long as everything stays on the schedule there, which we know it won't. So uh, it's like you picked a great time to come into this world. Uh, no, but uh, 
Yeah, it's it's going to be a fun team. Bowie is definitely going to be the place to go, I think, for like elite talent. Like that infield, I feel like we could have that same conversation this year. Like, how do you get all those guys playing time like you did with Del Marva last year? Um, but it's I'm interested to see like Toby Welk moving to the outfield. Yeah. I thought that was weird. But it's also kind of like, well, he probably had to add that to his repertoire and he's going to have to make that work or like, where is he going to get at bats? Mm -hmm. Um, So it's kind of either become more versatile, like some of these other guys are doing, the Adam Halls and others of the world, um, or, you know, you get squeezed out. So we'll see how that plays out. Also, like who plays center field? Is it Hudson Haskin? Uh, Is it Zach Watson? Um, Two interesting guys there. The pitching staff, you guys already mentioned the names there. A lot of guys who broke out last year, I think internally, and I think all these guys have a chance to shock the rest of like the prospect community and become well known outside of our bubble. Um, they're right, they're teetering right there. And now, you know, guys like Peak and Young and Rom, Bishop, even you're in Double A. Now's your chance to prove it. Uh, and I'm very anxious to see who steps up, accepts that challenge, uh, and who ends up, you know, getting passed by. Um, so we'll see. And I think they've got the man, the perfect guy behind the plate, Maverick Hanley, to help them. I think that's going to be a beautiful marriage between Hanley and this pitching staff. Go back to when we talked to Zach Peak uh, a couple of months ago now. And he said it's clear that they love, the guys love pitching to Maverick Hanley. So it was going to be a whole lot of fun to go watch. Yeah, for sure. Hanley behind the plate is great. I want to see if his hitting improvements that he did at driveline are going to stand out. Uh, Adam Hall, is he really going to be this year's breakout player like uh, Matt Blood has talked about in some interviews? And how soon before Zach Watson gets the call up to Norfolk and maybe Colton Kowser takes his place in the Bowie center field? Just a thought before we move on to Aberdeen. Can you picture what the outfield is going to be like on nights where you have Adam Hall, Zach Watson, Hudson Haskin out there? Is, is the ball actually going to hit the ground? Because those three can cover some ground out there. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's you're going to have to hit the wall or hit it over, I think. <laughs> so we'll go now to Aberdeen, which has a really interesting mix. And once again, a pretty good infield. But I think the highlight here is probably the outfield, where you're going to have Billy Cook, Colton Cowser, John Rhodes, and Dante Williams, all 2021 draftees, with Cowser as a first-round pick. All four performed well at their run at Del Marva last year. So seeing them... Here is not a surprise, but still something that Ironbird fans can really look forward to. But the infield, uh, Cesar Prieto, we now have the answer on where he is starting. He will head to Aberdeen, and he will be joined in that infield by Jacob Teeter, Connor Norby, Colin Burns, T.T. Bowens, and Kobe Mayo, who is making the leap from Del Marva after an excellent year. A good group behind the plate in Connor Pavloni and Ramon Rodriguez. I think that's pretty solid right there. And then the pitching staff, if you want to look for possible breakout candidates this year, I would suggest taking a deep dive into Aberdeen's roster because you have Carlos Tavera and Peter Van Loon, two guys that we have talked about on this show as possible breakouts, as well as Noah DeNoyer, a guy that all three of us are pretty high on coming into this year. You have Ignacio Feliz, who had his ups and downs at high A last year, but we're pretty hopeful he's going to put it together this year. You've also got Houston and Nick Roth, Griffin McClarty, and of course, I can't forget to mention they have Dean Pinto. Uh, drop everything you're doing the first time Pinto takes the mound at Ripken Stadium this summer and or this spring and go watch it. Um, so that pitching staff, there's a lot of potential for breakout, but you also really got to like just how good this outfield is, especially because – as Bob alluded to when we were talking about Bowie, you might not see Colton Cowser in Aberdeen for very long. Yeah, as far as hitters go, like this is my favorite roster. Like I, I do love Bowie's infield; is phenomenal, top end talent, guys we hope to see in the major leagues very soon. But this Aberdeen, Kobe Mayo, Norby, Preto, Jacob Teeter, TT Bowens, uh, Cowser, Rhodes, Dante Williams, like it just goes on and on. Like there are no holes in this lineup. And the catcher, hopefully the primary catcher, there's going to be Connor Pavoloni, which I think is an underrated guy. Draft pick last year out of Tennessee. He's got good power too. I mean, this, these guys are going to put up some monster home run totals in Aberdeen. Um, I'm interested to see how these guys fare against high pitching. Um, they're going to make a big jump, and, and we'll see who accepts this challenge. But these are all high floor guys uh, for sure. Um, the pitching, like you mentioned, 
I, I think that's perfect summation there, the pitching. Like if you're looking for a breakout star, go to Aberdeen because you don't see a lot of sexy names other than Gene Pinto. Um, just tiny fireball of athletic ability and pitching genius over here. But behind him, like who's going to be that breakout guy? Is it Denoyer? Is it McClarty? Is it Tavera? Is it Jake Prezina? Is there more there with him? Like, I mean, it's, I, I'll be the hype man for this rotation and say I think it's underrated and I think uh, people should pay attention to it because someone's going to break through, not named Gene Pinto, is going to break through and be a guy. Um, and so we'll, we'll see. Uh, but the bullpen too, looking at the bullpen, like Peter Van Loon, I'm a huge Van Loon guy. Uh, I'm stoked to see him in the year in double A. I don't know what it is. If it's the name, if it's that he's like seven feet tall out there, the slider, I don't know what it is. He doesn't walk anybody, but Peter Van Loon, like, that's the jersey I want. I, I have Peter Van Loon stand 100% over here. For, keep your other Russian jerseys. <laughs> Nick Swoons for <laughs> Peter Van Loon. Um, if I didn't care about my, my marriage, I would make sure to see every Gene Pinto start this year, whether it's in Aberdeen on the road, when he goes up to Bowie. I, I, I got to at least make sure I see one of his first few in Aberdeen. That's super exciting to me. Um, I completely agree with, with the pitching. I mean, and it was kind of this way last year, I feel like, because this is going to be where the the guys that the Orioles do draft, uh, the pitchers that the Orioles do draft out of college, but then don't get much time at the end of the previous year. It's like, okay, so what do we have here? There's a lot of names that we saw like five innings from or 10 innings from or maybe less. Arm Brewster, um, Tavera, Van Loon, you know, you name it. So I'm curious to see which of those guys. I'm I, I'm very excited to see Carlos Tavera. I think that's a guy that could also break out in a way, big way this year. And can Ignacio Feliz bounce back? Noah Denoyer, you know, Cinderella story there. So, yeah, love the pitching. The position players, it's like when you have players that you're going to have on your bench that you're like, man, this is a decent prospect. He should be getting every day at bats. You know you're deep, at least at this level and throughout the whole system. So, yeah, Kobe Mayo just turned 20 years old three months ago, four months ago, and he's going to be the starting third baseman in high A, and who knows how quickly he can move up to double A if he's as good as we think he is. And Cesar Prieto, Connor Norby, Colin Burns. Is Colin Burns even going to play? And he's like a legitimately decent prospect. So, God, it's an exciting team. Can't wait to see him in action. Yeah, Absolutely. Would you have thought a year ago this time that we would be sitting here now talking about Kobe Mayo and high A? No way. <laughs> Not until he – I didn't even think he was going to get the promotion to DeMarvel late last year. And then he gets that, hits even better there, destroys the ball, and then it's like, well, that's enough. Move him up to high A. Yeah, that's very impressive, and, and I love to see the aggressiveness by the front office. Yeah, I, I think we talked about that at least once on the show uh, or had a question about that and thought for sure once he get because he started the season late as well uh, with that knee injury. So I thought for sure he's so young. You're going to keep him in the FCL all year. He'll come out, maybe even skip Del Marva, maybe a couple of weeks in Del Marva this year and ends up in high A. But yeah, it's and Jonathan Mayo, uh, Uncle Mayo over there mentioned like, it's the hitability. He's he impressed even guys who were high on Kobe Mayo. Um, he exceeded their expectations. So I think he's definitely the most exciting player on this roster. But yeah, you mentioned Colin Burns. That's the interesting one. Like Burns getting the call up um, over some guys. You know, like there are some guys not listed. I think I actually put together the list of all the guys. Like where are they? I don't see them on any roster. Um, you know, is Servideo, guy like Anthony Servideo, is he hurt? Maybe going to come around later and take a spot in, in Aberdeen at some point. But regardless, um, I don't think you see a I think there are a lot of guys on this roster that can move up pretty quickly. So it'll be interesting to see how the Orioles handle these guys. And it's pretty uh, easy to see when it's all listed out like this, why a guy like Daryl Hernandez, who we thought for sure would move up to Aberdeen to start the year, he's starting back at Delmarva because Aberdeen's loaded already with guys. And, you know, it wouldn't, I don't think it's going to hurt as I'm trying to transition to the Marva here. Um, I don't think it's going to hurt him to repeat that level and, and find some confidence and see his own improvements facing the same level of competition. Yeah. And he needs every day at bats and hopefully, you know, it, cause these things have a way of sorting themselves out as we saw last year. And things can start changing quickly 
So hopefully he's somebody who goes back to Delmarva, gets regular at-bats, hits well, does what we all know he's capable of doing, and then gets that bump up to Aberdeen and you know gets a chance to prove himself at the next level. So we'll use that to actually transition to the discussion about Delmarva's roster, which comes out pretty much as we have been advertising it and most observers of the Orioles have been advertising it throughout this offseason, which is a loaded – with players who were signed off the international market. Miss Al De Son, who got there late last year, is going to be back in Delmarva, but then he's going to be joined by players like Isaac De Leon, Moises Ramirez, Noel Breath Romero, who was part of the trade for um, Andrew Castro with the Red Sox a few years ago. And then you look at this pitching staff, Moises Chasse, Raul Rangel. Uh, definitely some interesting names that could break out. I'm going to go with one player, though, that I'm really interested to follow who was not an international signing, and that's Ryan Higgins, who was drafted by the Orioles last year. We unfortunately did not get to see much of him after the draft because of an injury, but this is someone who had you know interesting power in college, ninth-round pick. Going to be excited to see what he does at third base every day in Del Mar, but pres- presuming that's where he's going to play. Yeah, that's I noted him as well. And talking about Hernandez, like I do feel bad for Hernandez, but like he's so young, and if I'm sure he's probably got to be frustrated. And if he is, like especially watching 2021 draft picks leapfrog him, but you know I hope if he is frustrated, he uses that to his advantage and he channels that and he puts up a monster season. I think what was that stat? Like he only faced like six at bats all year against uh, pitchers who were what younger than him or older than him or whatever that, that stat was, but. Point being that he was so young and played pretty well, uh, quietly had a decent season. Uh, I'm also excited for Ryan Higgins. He's got, I think he's got big power in that bat. Uh, interesting to see what he does. Um, but yeah, the two names for me are Moises Chasse and Raul Renho. Like I, Delmarva Stadium, Purdue Stadium is like four, four and a half hours away from me. Um, I will drive out there um, with a two month old. I don't care uh, to watch these guys pitch. Um, Juan De Los Santos is another name that I think is I'm really interested uh, to watch in full season ball. Uh, and there's some other guys like some later 2020 draft picks like Connor Grady, uh, Ryan Long. Ryan Long is that's he came out like D3 or NAIA, like Panoma State or some college out in California. Um, the data on him looks really interesting. Uh, so I'm excited to see what he can do. But um, yeah, it's some interesting pictures of a lot of UDFAs, Daniel Fetterman, uh, Shane Davis. I have a soft spot for him, but I think it's telling that he's back in low A this year, but you mentioned the story here is the international guys. Um, yeah. I'm Jose, Jose Cruz. Once he hits his first home run with Delmarva, like I'm losing it. That guy is a monster human being and I cannot wait to watch him. And one more name, uh, Luis Valdez. I actually saw some video of him when I, I was, thought I saw the name before, but I wasn't super familiar with him. Um, uh, but he's going to be, I don't know how high he's going to end up climbing in the system, but he's going to be like a, a lightning rod type player for Del Marva. So if you go to Del Marva to watch these guys, watch out for Valdez because he's going to be a lot of fun to watch. Speedy infielder, outfield utility guy, not a lot of power, but he'll be a fun utility player this year. So excited for Del Marva. This is like the the uh, what is it, homecoming for the international awakening that the Orioles have gone through. I mean, and it's not going to, slow down throughout the year. If anything, it's just going to get more and more exciting as guys like Michael Hernandez, Samuel Basayo, potentially, you know, some of these guys, Anderson Dos Santos, they could potentially earn a promotion the way Kobe Mayo did last year and make it stateside. Some of these guys could get promoted to high A Aberdeen. I mean, Moises Chasse and Raul Rangel, that <laughs> Nick nailed it. Those are the guys, Michelle Desson, uh, even Isaac Bellany, I feel like is a, is a cool guy to watch. He's always wearing the shades. I love to see that. Um, and Isaac De Leon, I want to, I want to be able to see these guys that, uh, our buddy Eric Garfield has been raving about all of last year. I want to see them on my uh, computer monitor. So I completely understand if the more, I I don't want to say casual, if you're watching minor league baseball, you're not a casual, but if you're just like, you know, looking at top 30 list to see which, which game do I want to watch? Yeah. Maybe Del Marva's not going to be that at least in, in the beginning of the year until some of these guys break out. But for me, it's like, I got to see what these guys are all about. I think it's going to be exciting because you know at least a few of these guys are breaking out in a big way. You hit it there too. Like these aren't even the top international guys. Deson, for sure you can throw him in there, but these aren't the top guys. So if 
Delmarva plays really well and some of these guys start breaking out, like just imagine when we get to see Braylon Tavera and Hernandez and Basayo and, and uh, Edwin Amparo and all these other guys, these recent top signs that got a million plus dollars. Um, that's why Delmarva, man, like a lot of people are excited for this team and it's, this is a big reason why. Yeah, Bob, I'm glad you mentioned Bellamy. He's a holdover from the Dan Duquette years. He was signed in the 2018 uh, free agent class. And it's interesting to look at the numbers that he put together in the FCL last year, finishing with an OPS of just over 800. Uh, he's 21 or, excuse me, 20 years old. He'll be 21 at the end of this year. So young guy for the level, coming off a pretty solid season, um, definitely interested to see what he does for them this year. And I think, are, are there any names that you guys don't see that you're curious as to why you don't see them around? Because I got a few, but I don't know if you guys have paid attention to that. Steven Acevedo, who I mentioned earlier, I f- felt like he might have been able to start. Uh, Elio Prado, a couple guys that maybe they're just, you know, they need a little more time down in Sarasota, maybe they'll start an FCL and work their way up from there, or maybe maybe it's an injury. There's always the possibility of injuries that we don't know about. Yeah, and I suspect we'll get more clarity here over the coming days about why certain players aren't assigned. Greg Cullen and AJ Graffinino stood out to me. Um, there's so much middle infield depth at high A and double A that it's easy to overlook, but you know, Colin was a guy that we were talking about back in the Arizona Fall League as a possible breakout candidate for this year. And Graffinino has always gotten, going back to when he was drafted by the Braves, rave reviews for his defense. Um, he just hasn't had really a full season in the minor leagues to put together the kind of offensive breakout that some were hoping for. But the defense has always been lauded. So I was, you know, that was a guy that I looked at and I thought wherever he goes, he'll help out the pitching staff every night that he's on the field, just because that defense up the middle is so good. Yeah. Also, uh, sorry, one more. I just thought of if I thought we were only talking about low a, but uh, Jake Lyons is one that I was yeah. curious about. Yeah. And back to Graffinino too. I think Tim Dijon like shouted him out as that under the radar defensive guy. And he hasn't played you know, since 2018 really, but yeah, uh, Eric mentioned there Servideo. He only saw Servideo maybe once on the field. I hope, you know, I know he had a lot of injuries last year, so I hope he can get out on the field quickly this year. Um, Luis Ortiz, the the left-hander, I'm surprised I don't see his name. Um, and Trendon Craig was a name. I, this is a guy that the Orioles has been hyping up, uh, and I thought he spent – he was, I want to say, the only hitter. Uh, of that 2021 draft class, free agent class that didn't get moved up to Delmarva. He stuck around. Um, so I'm surprised he's not on Delmarva right now. You mentioned Elio Prado, Greg Cullen, Jake Lyons was a definite one. Um, Dylan Hyde, we've heard so much about Dylan Hyde and this data darling, this pitcher. Still haven't seen him pitch. And uh, Christopher Cespedes, where Cespedes, uh, the masher, I don't know where he's at. Uh, and Gene Carmona was the other one. It's so interesting. I hope. Unfortunately, I think we're going to see a, a big wave of releases over the next co- couple of days. Uh, but, um, yeah, I'm curious to know which of these guys are hurt and which of these guys maybe we see added over the next week or so. But Yeah, and, and a little more clarity. And just for any listeners who may have missed it, um, Kyle Bradis we knew was going to be held back initially, so that's why he is not on Norfolk's roster. You also don't see D.L. Hall on the roster because – He's being held back to be stretched out. The expectation is right now that Braddis is not going to be in Sarasota very long before we see him as an affiliate. Hall will probably be a little bit behind Braddis, but hopefully here in the coming weeks, we're seeing both of them on the mound somewhere. I don't, Braddis's case, I don't know that it's necessarily tied to injury. It might just be that he didn't get a chance to stretch out in spring training the way that he normally would have because he was on the 40 man roster and, affected by the lockout, unlike players like Grayson Rodriguez. Yeah, and I, I think, I don't know if this was another podcast or an article or a tweet, so I apologize if you're listening and you were the one that said this first, uh, and I can give you like credit here, but I think the Orioles are pretty proud of what they can do uh, off the field. You know, look at the alt site, look at what they can do in Sarasota. So they probably feel like it's more beneficial to keep stretching Bradish and Hall out in Sarasota versus throwing them in the fire in, in Norfolk or Bowie. So 
I imagine Bradish joins Norfolk's rotation pretty soon, and he's probably not there very long. Um, and yeah, they cut Ali Rutschman. He's not on any of these rosters. That scrub catcher over there. Uh, but yeah, Vivek, was that Vivek? That's it, Keegan Gillis. I want to see that 100 mile an hour fastball. Where's Keegan Gillis at? I don't know, but we got rosters. Got, got guys like Tyler Nevin who are still in Major League Camp, could yep. eventually find their way down to AAA. So yeah, this is not final, final. And I think, you know, a month or two into the season is when you'll really just see where everyone lands. But no matter what, it's exciting. There are lists of names that are about to start playing baseball in a few days. Before we wrap up tonight, I just want to mention that friend of the show, Stephen Loftus, bittersweet news here. He has left Baltimore sports in life. The good news, though, he has been hired by the Atlanta Braves. Um, Stephen, as our listeners know, and as Bob and Nick and I had the good fortune to see firsthand, passionate about his work, very smart guy. So we are so happy for him. Uh, Congrats to him and congrats to the Braves. They got a good one. As for us here at Baltimore Sports and Life, Chris Stoner and Matt Corey will continue to do a great job over at the warehouse. Steven's last show with them is out now, but we'll continue to keep going on here. We'll continue to cover the draft. They'll continue their major league coverage, but uh, Steven, we're going to miss you. Yeah. Can't wait for that Orioles Braves World Series in five years. It's going to be Steven's guys versus uh, Michael Elias guys. And, um, you know, best of luck. No. Yeah. Well deserved. Can- Absolutely. Congratulations to Steven. It's great news. And uh, I know Johnny always looking at his chops thinking I, I got that leaderboard right in front of me. <laughs> Straight shot. Yeah, you, you're still you still got like five appearances to go, John. You're still back a little ways, but you're I'm sure you'll work your way up this summer. Um, so, Bob and Nick, we've covered a lot. And in fact, we've covered so much. We had to do two shows this week because we need to do opening day predictions still, which is going to come out in an an episode later this week, but any final thoughts before we wrap up? Excited for tomorrow night. Triple A. Let's go. Yeah. Norfolk starts Tuesday night. Uh, They're playing an exhibition game right now as we speak against Norfolk state. Uh, I don't see any updates though. That's unfortunate. Um, But yeah, this is super exciting. This is what we're here for. This is why we wake up every single day to provide uh, this fantastic coverage. Um, Check out the Patreon as well. The daily podcast we're going to start up this week. Um, yeah, minor league baseball is finally back. Let's let's get it rolling. Let's see some development. Absolutely. We will be back later this week with our opening day prediction show, so be sure to check that out. In the meantime, follow us on Twitter at BSL and the Burrs, and check out BaltimoreSportsAndLife.com for Orioles opening day coverage as well as coverage of college sports, the NFL, and more. Hop on the discussion board and join the conversation with fellow readers of the site as well as contributors to BSL. Uh, For Bob Phelan and Nick Stevens, thank you to Jonathan Mayo for appearing on tonight's show. Uh, This is Zach Spedden. You've been listening to On the Verge.